Thank you, Tricia. Excellent. Good morning. Good morning. How is everyone today? I hope you are well. It is good to see you, and I welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, today, the, um, uh, you may get some extra background noise or something because the little foam thing uh, finally died that was up here on the, uh, on the microphone. And so sometimes when, without those, sometimes uh, peas will pop a little bit more, or you'll hear more 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 breath noises or something like that. So so I'm trying to maintain a little bit of a distance so I'm not making too much extra noise. There's a Steve Miller song. I think it's I think it's Keep on Rockin' Me Baby where you, where in you're listening to the the song at the beginning whenever Steve Miller is getting ready to sing, you can hear him go and then he starts to sing. Keep on a rock and I, as many, I've played that song a hundred times, and I, I hated it every single time. And so I'm hoping I don't do that to you uh, this morning. Uh, you can see the announcements listed here in the uh, worship folder. Uh, this week is our week at Second Hand Rose, so hopefully you'll be able to help with that. If you are not able to for some reason, let Patty Stauffer know, and she'll help you find another volunteer to cover. Uh, next Sunday, November the 24th, uh, after worship uh, and uh, after some fellowship time, we will have our Hanging of the Greens, and we will transform from a... Uh, 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 a, a harvest uh, type theme uh, into a, a, a more Christmassy theme. Some of the orange and reddish things, will, golden things, will be gone, replaced by green and and red and white things. It's going to be it's going to be a little bit different, and it's always fun uh, being a part of that. I always enjoy doing the hanging of the green. So I hope you'll be able to stay next Sunday and help us with that. Looking ahead to Sunday, December first, that is the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, the theme for that day is hope. Uh, on December the 6th, Friday the 6th at 5.30, his kids, which is uh, preschool through fifth grade, uh, that's going to be here uh, at the church at 5.30. Uh, and then looking ahead to December the 8th, the second Sunday of Advent, the theme that Sunday will be love. Uh, also, the Lifeline Food Pantry, uh, this month our uh, donations for that are sugar. They're asking for sugar uh, to help prepare for Christmas, I guess so that there can be more sugar plum fairies that uh, children can have dancing in their head as they are dreaming on Christmas Eve. Uh, and so uh, if you have some sugar, you can bring that in. Uh, you can leave it on the bench out in the, in the front and we'll see that it gets to the pantry. Uh, what else do we have to share with one another? I've got one from the balcony. Yes. So I was made aware with the Christmas baskets that are usually handled through the Polo Council of Churches, and I believe it's Pine Creek Christian Church that's coordinating it this year. Um, they decided to go through the food pantry to order the baskets. So instead of donating our usual items, for our church it was usually mac and cheese, they asked that we donate $20 instead towards each basket that we wanted to support. Okay, thank you very much. Are there others? All right, I have information about the Christmas stars, the community stars for children in the community who are in need of Christmas gifts. That tree will go up November 26th. So I will get some stars um, and be able to distribute those on Sunday, December 1st. And the gifts are due back on December 15th. So you would have two weeks to purchase items and return them to the church. On the 15th, we'll wrap them um, as a congregation, and then I'll take them to the bank on Monday morning. So if you would like to do that, please come and talk to me so that I can kind of approximate a number of stars to get. Also, December 7th, we're gonna be hosting a soup luncheon here at the church for the kids' ministry. That is Polo's Christmas Festival Day. If you would like to make a crock pot of soup, or a salad, or some desserts, please let me know. All right, thank you very much, Courtney. Are there others? 
I think I just did it. No, maybe it wasn't me. Okay, go ahead. The uh, bathroom remodeling project uh, is uh, almost complete. Uh, maybe by next Sunday uh, we'll be able to uh, use the new restroom facilities and uh, I, I'm really happy with the work that's uh, being done there. If you haven't had a chance yet, why well, uh, you can stick your head in the door and take a peek and uh, hopefully uh, you're happy too. <laughs> Uh, we are getting some tuck pointing work done on the church, on the brick on the outside. Uh, it's something we've been wanting to do for quite some time, and we've uh, uh, located uh, a tuck pointer, a stonemason, uh, thanks to Brad Tegler, and so we're getting some of that work done too. Final thing, uh, I continue to be amazed by the work of Bob Heath on uh, the leaf management and the coordinating with the city to pick up leaves. and. The physical raking that he does, it's amazing. And so a big thank you to Bob. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. And yeah, if you do go down and take a look at the restrooms, make sure you have someone with you uh, because you might faint when you see them uh, <laughs> com compared to how they, they used to look. It's, they're really nice. Just a reminder that the STAR project is taking place of the Joy Partners. Um, so we will not be doing the Joy Partners this year. Um, Shoot, there was something else besides. I know that, but I can't, I can't remember the other one. <laughs> uh, Laura, Laura Vach Klein contacted me yesterday, and she wanted me to let the congregation know that Tom and Nancy are celebrating their 60th anniversary on November 28th. And um, I think they are having treats that Sunday. But Laura wanted people to be aware in case you were interested in sending a card their direction. Thank you very much. Are there others? If not, then I invite you to join us in our uh, first hymn. It's number 28, verses one, two, and three. Breathe upon us, Holy Spirit. You're welcome to stand if you wish. Please join me in our prayer of invocation that's found here in your worship folder. 
God, we pray that your presence is made real in our worship this morning and that it is made real in our lives. Help us to know your leading, to repent of our sins, and to live as people forgiven by you and filled with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You can be seated. In terms of joys and concerns, you can see a few of the prayer concerns listed here in the worship folder. Uh, the district congregation for which we pray this week is the Yellow Creek uh, congregation. Uh, there's a picture of Yellow Creek there. Uh, and in the background, just behind them there on the, on the left, you see a house kind of sticking out. That's the old parsonage uh, that was moved there. Uh, I don't know when it was moved there, but many, many years ago. Uh, it's no longer used as a parsonage. It is used as a, um, uh, a secondhand clothing uh, outlet. Uh, and it is, it is full. It is full of all kinds of clothes. They have all kinds of people that come. I, I think it's either free or something like 50 cents a piece of clothing. I'm not sure what. Uh, I think it may be free because there's just so much stuff they'd never be able to, to sell it even at, a, even at a, a dollar a shirt or something. And so, but they have all kinds of people come uh, and take stuff out. Every, every few months they have people come and uh, take like a, a truckload to, uh, to Kentucky or Tennessee or some other different places where it can be used. Ellis Bowton is a pastor up there. Uh, Yellow Creek has, a, has an important ministry and we're glad for their ministry. We're also glad for the Ministry of Messenger, uh, which is our uh, denominational magazine, Wendy McFadden is the uh, editor. Uh, I've written for Messenger a couple times. I think some other folks here have as well. It's an excellent uh, magazine and a good, there are, uh, every month there are d a lot of different things. Bible studies, uh, news from around the denomination, uh, letters to the editor that one of the things I look at is uh, every, every uh, month, every issue, there's a listing of like, who are the new members in each congregation? Uh, deaths, anniversaries, ordinations, different things like that. It's, and it's interesting to, to go through, see a, lot of, see a lot of names you know, see growth at a lot of different congregations, uh, the new people who are listed as members there. It's very cool. We're thankful for the, the ministry of Messenger, Wendy, and all the different people uh, that work with them. Uh, we continue in further prayer for the family of, uh, of uh, Jim Rippey. Uh, his wife, Lisa, is someone that the uh, church has helped uh, in a number of ways over the years. They had a, I think they used to live across from uh, Julia uh, Person, more or less across the street, and they had a fire there uh, several years ago. Um, uh, Jim has been on uh, disability for a long time, died a couple of weeks ago now. Uh, Lisa is uh, seeking financial help with uh, paying for his uh, uh, service. Cremation, I think, is what she's looking at. I've seen um, um, uh, jars for collecting money, uh, one or two. I know I saw one at uh, the Polo Market. There may be others around town someplace. If you'd be interested in making a contribution toward that, if that's something you're able to do, uh, let me know, and I can see that that gets to her. But we pray for uh, uh, the Jim Rippey uh, family. Uh, as he, as they continue to work through not just the emotional loss, uh, but the difference that that makes in their lives uh, moving forward. We continue in prayer for Donna Humphreys, back with us again, second week in a row. She came a little bit further forward this time, so that's good. Eventually, she'll make her way all the way down here to the front. That'll be great. I'm looking forward to that. Each, each week, as she gets a little bit better, she'll come just a little bit further forward. Continue in prayer for Mary Mooring, for Eileen Kinney, uh, for Bill and for Betty Hare, for Pam Lindsley. Uh, for disaster uh, response, I meant to, to print it out and bring it up here um, as part of talking about the two cent a meal offering, and I failed to do that, but I'll go ahead and mention it now. Uh, um, the the uh, disaster response groups uh, for, within the Church of the Brethren made, a, made uh, several grants, uh, tens of thousands of dollars in grants uh, in some places, a couple hundred thousand dollars to continue relief ministry in a whole lot of different places. In, in Kentucky, for instance, uh, where the flooding that they are working on recovering from happened two years ago. 
Uh, so those, those kind of projects, we think about them in the short term. We think about them in the immediate term, you know, the, the day after or the week after the hurricane or the flood or whatever it is. But those projects go on for a long, long time. Uh, it's not just a matter of, of, you know, it's not something you clean up from in a very, very short time. Uh, we are, uh, as, uh, as has been mentioned, uh, with an anniversary coming up, we're thankful for anniversaries. I know Jim had a birthday this past week. Other, other people have anniversaries and birthdays and things, and, and we're thankful for those people, thankful for those relationships, and always glad to be able to celebrate. Uh, what else do we have to share with one another? Yes. Um, I just realized that Ashley and Jake are not here, so this is a good time for me to remind you ah. that they are having a surprise slash anniversary birthday party for Ashley and Jake on November 23rd, so this coming Saturday, 5 o'clock at the Shed Tap and Grill in Walnut. Everyone is invited. Ashley and Jake still do not know, so it is a surprise. They've been married 10 years, and they're celebrating their 40th birthdays. So. Join us. Excellent. So if you need if you need more details on that, get with Courtney, uh, and you can write down the exact time, the location, all that kind of stuff. And also regarding Jake and Ashley and the surprise party, um, it's a card shower, <clears throat> so no gifts, just cards. Thank you, Julia. Are there others? In regards to the food pantry. Just so some of you are more aware of, our needs are increasing every week. So far this month, we have already assisted 88 families. We are fast approaching, well, the last two months we have had over 100 families, so I'm sure we're going to go over that now. Our shelves are very bare right now. Right now we have maybe two boxes of cereal, we have no rice -a -roni. we have no hamburger helper or anything like that. So if any of you would be inclined to do something extra for the pantry this month, that would much be appreciated. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, um, joy that my um, son, okay, Johnny, and I forget if I've told you this, but he finally got onto power as, in, like, as he would tell me, Mom, I'm really alignment now. Um, because uh, he's at school in Ohio and going for several weeks of training to kind of go over all the things he learned at Southeast Lyman Training Center. Um, so I have a joy in that and also a concern as a mother because yes, we so pray that he um, studies this well, learns it well, and um, that he doesn't go, you know, because that would be <laughs> the worst ever. Um, um, also be thankful that my brother is still alive and Johnny's two dogs because my brother let the two dogs out and uh -oh. they got away and got into the creek and they came back the German Shepherd looked like a black dog and completely trashed my bathroom when we had to give them a bath. So be thankful that they're all still alive. We're glad they came back, but that was big. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh. It was just a huge joy last week with the band and the way people were singing. And I don't know about anybody else, but I was in tears at the end and, and got the wonder. So it, it was great. Thanks, everybody. They did a great job. It was a lot of fun. Anyone else? All right. Then I'll ask you to join me in our prayer hymn, number 491, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling.
Let's pray. God, your call is on our lives in many ways. You call us close to you. You call us to, you call us as, as sinners. You call us to confess our sins, to repent of our sins, to claim your sacrifice, which covers our sins, and to, uh, to, to do better. You forgive us. And you call us to claim that forgiveness and live out of it as we repent. You call us as workers. You call us in, to, to do the work of your kingdom, to do the work of your body uh, here in this world that you have created. You give each of us gifts and talents and skills and abilities and ways to use them. And we are thankful for that. You, you call us in, in so many different ways. You call us as, as, as sinners, as workers, as servants. You call us friends. You call us as people about whom you care. People that you know in a personal, intimate way. As your spirit is within us. You call us in so many ways. And you are real in our lives in so many ways. There are so many things for which we are thankful and things for which we pray. We're thankful for Ellis Bowton and for the ministry of the Yellow Creek Congregation. We're thankful for the ministry of the Messenger Magazine. In our thanksgiving for those things, we pray for them, that they know your leading and your spirit and that they know what it is that you call them to do and say and how you call them to minister, just as we pray that for each of us. We pray for Jim Rippey's family, for Lisa, uh, for their daughter Shantae, uh, for their son. We pray for those touched by his loss as they try to adjust to what life is like uh, without him uh, and as they uh, try to figure out how to deal with the challenges and changes that come with his passing. We continue in prayer for, for Donna Humphreys, for Mary Mooring, uh, for Eileen Kinney, for Bill and for Betty Hare, for Pam Lindsley. We pray for all of those involved in disaster response, both near and far. We pray for uh, anniversaries, and celebrations, and birthdays, and relationships. We, give, us, give us an awareness, God, of the way that we can celebrate one another, the ways that we can lift one another up, the ways that we can express our happiness 
for one another. Thank you, God, for each person that we celebrate, each relationship that, that we celebrate. Uh, we uh, think this morning about Tom and Nancy, about Jake and Ashley. There are other relationships, other people who are important to us. We may not be aware of the birthday or the anniversary or whatever it may be, but we are thankful for them. We are thankful for those people. We're thankful for the ministry of the Lifeline Food Pantry, for each person who donates, each person who volunteers, for those who, uh, who uh, operate uh, the ministry. Uh, and we're thankful, God, for those who come and, and partake of, of what is offered there. We're not thankful that that they aren't secure financially. We're not thankful that they are not secure in terms of food, and we pray that they find financial and, and food security, but we're thankful for them as individuals. We're thankful for them as families. We're thankful for them as people willing to admit their need. Some of us aren't always able to admit our needs. Well, we're thankful for them as people willing to take steps to, to deal with whatever their needs are. Sometimes when we recognize our needs, we just say, well, that it is what it is. And we accept the way it is. We're thankful for people who, who provide help. We're thankful for people who need help. And we're thankful for ministries like the Lifeline Food Pantry that bring the two together, that they can find the grace both in giving and in receiving. We're thankful for Trisha's son uh, for his, as he continues his training. We, we do pray safety for him, for all those others in training, and we pray for safety, God, for, for linemen and, and for others who work in, in dangerous situations, situations that require specialized training and specialized uh, ability. Uh, we pray for their safety. We're thankful for their willingness to serve. We're thankful, God, for those who serve by providing music and music ministry, not just the people here in, in our congregation, but last week the opportunity we had to hear the, uh, the Polo Schools uh, jazz combo. We're thankful for uh, Mr. Mack, the teacher. We're thankful for the three students who came and, and shared with us. We're thankful for all of those involved in the various uh, programs, not just here at the Polo School, but in other schools in our surrounding area, whether they're music programs, sports programs, academic programs, science or math programs, whatever they may be, God. We're glad for those programs. We're glad for people that, that make those things happen, teachers that give of their time to make those things happen, and students that, who learn and grow and develop uh, through exposure to those programs. There are so many other things for which we are thankful and things for which we pray. We don't know all of the needs in, in our own lives, let alone the needs in the lives of people around us. We don't know all the things for which we have to be joyful, let alone the, things, the people around us and what they may have to thank you for. You know those things, God. Hear our prayers and hear our praise, whether it is spoken or whether it is silent and in our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. It is time to share out of our uh, two cent uh, a meal offerings. Uh, our two cents worth uh, is, uh, is how it is sometimes uh, phrased. And we usually think, usually we say, you know, Actually, now that I think about it, it's not an expression we use a whole lot anymore. We used to say, you know, who asked for your two cents worth if someone would offer a, an unwanted uh, or uh, opinion about something or we disagreed with them. And two cents worth was, was kind of a pejorative, uh, negative kind of a thing. Uh, and I'm glad that, uh, that through ministries like this, we've transformed it into something that is a positive thing. Your two cents worth matters. Your gift matters whatever it may be, large or small, through the ministry of Growing Hope globally, through other ministries like, uh, like Heifer Project and Disaster Ministries, uh, your gifts matter and make a difference in the lives of people uh, near and far. 
Uh, you're invited, if you wish, to come forward uh, and place your two cent a meal gifts here in the jar. Uh, if you're not able to or do not wish to come forward, you can put them uh, marked in the offering plate and Brent will see that they get to the right place. All of those nice things I said about the uh, two cent a meal offering are true of our regular offerings as well. Uh, they typically are larger than our two cent a meal offerings. That doesn't mean they're more important, doesn't mean they're better, uh, but uh, it's important uh, that we share them, that we share financially, that we share emotionally, uh, that we share uh, physically, that we do all of the things that God calls us to do and share all of the gifts that God causes us to share or calls us to share. Uh, our offering hymn as the uh, ushers collect your offerings is number 644 verses 1, 3, and 4. When morning gilds the skies. God, we praise you with our gifts. We thank you with our gifts. We follow your call with our gifts. Help us to be praised, not just with these financial gifts, but with everything we do and everything we say in every part of our lives. For this we'll be grateful as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Every, every, the last three or four Sundays, every Sunday, the chicken keeps moving around. Uh, people, the, when it was first up here, Julia was telling me, oh, look at that chicken, look at that chicken. And I came up here, I didn't see it at all. It was, it was right there. It was down there on the floor, kind of hidden in between a whole lot of things. Later on, it got moved and it was over here uh, in front of the uh, pulpit. And now it is up there. We, we might need to have, I don't know. I don't know, some, one, some Sunday when, when we know the kids are going to be here like three or four Sundays in a row, we might have a, like a 
hide the chicken or find the chicken type game or something like that. I have to, and there's a possibility for something there. Uh, we have two scripture readings this morning. The first is from Je Daniel, uh, the prophet Daniel chapter 12, verses one through three. God says uh, here through the prophet, uh, at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as not hap has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Our second reading is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher! What massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? Replied Jesus, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. And as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, uh, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. So when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. Stars show up in the Bible many, many times. They first show up right away uh, during the creation story. Uh, Genesis 1.16, God made two lights, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. God also made the stars. A lot of us remember God's promise to Abraham. There are a few places in Genesis where God compares the number of Abraham's descendants to, to the number of the stars. The first is in Genesis uh, chapter 15, verse five. God took Abraham outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars if indeed you can count them. And then God said to him, so shall your offspring be. Later, when the Israelites are preparing to enter the promised land and, and Moses is giving them his, his farewell speech, he reminds them of this and, and other verses and how, how this promise to Abraham has come true. Stars show up in reference to Jesus as well. We're not too far away uh, from a season when we will be reading some New Testament scripture about stars. Actually, one particular star. In Matthew 2, 2, uh, Magi come from the east and asked King Herod, where is the one who has been born the king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. Sometimes even we, as Christians, you and I are stars or compared to stars. That happens in our re reading from Daniel this morning where God says through the prophet that those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Now the, the Bible verses that appear every Sunday on our screen up here they don't always include all the different headings and things like that and divisions that are in the Bible when it's printed out on paper or, or when you read it online. And that makes sense because what, we've, what we focus on in our readings are the, the verses themselves. You know, Daniel 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. 
That's what we're focused on. But, but there are sometimes headings and introductions. Before our reading from Daniel, if you look in your pew Bible or if you look at a Bible at home or you look online, before our reading from Daniel, the beginning of chapter 12, there's a heading above, or chapter 13, excuse me, above chapter 13 that says, the end times. One of the words that we often use to describe the end times is apocalypse. And that is also a word that we use sometimes separately from the Bible, separately from faith, in a non-biblical sense. An apocalypse is something that involves destruction or damage at a catastrophic level. Uh, and sometimes we use it in ways where it doesn't necessarily fit. Sometimes we use it a little bit too freely. In the elections back in 2022, not the ones we just had, but, but two years ago, Republicans lost the Senate. They almost lost the House. They expected to win big in 2022. Some newspapers described this as an apocalyptic defeat in the sense that it was a catastrophe for the Republican Party. In the election we just finished, a lot of Democrats thought they had a shot at winning the House, maybe holding on to the Senate, maybe winning the presidency. They didn't, of course. I have seen some people describing that as a catastrophe, as an apocalypse. If it was a catastrophe and full destruction two years ago for the Republicans, and they came back in 2024, it may or may not be a catastrophe for the Democrats right now. It may not be apocalyptic. They may come back in 2026. Sometimes we use the term for things that aren't really destroyed. The Republican Party was not destroyed. The Democratic Party is not destroyed. You know, they're still here. Uh, the next election you go to, they're going to be on the ballot. The White Sox this past year, I know I make fun of them, and I shouldn't. I, I, I root for the White Sox as long with the Cubs. They were not expected this past year to, to win the pennant or anything like that, uh, but they were expected to be competitive. They were expected to, 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 to put up a good fight. Uh, instead, they had the worst record in modern baseball history. Going back into the 1800s, the very worst was like the Cleveland Spite, was the Cleveland Spiders, and I should have looked up the year, I want to say 1894. Uh, but after that, it was the White Sox this past season. Some people talk about the New York Mets from 1962 and how terribly bad they were. The White Sox were worse. That, you know, that is an apocalypse, a catastrophe, destruction on a historic level, if you're a White Sox fan. So sometimes in our world, an apocalypse is a matter of perspective. In the Bible, we usually think of the apocalypse, not an apocalypse, but the apocalypse, as being described in the book of Revelations. Uh, but there are shorter descriptions of the apocalypse in several places in the Bible. There's this one from Daniel, uh, which, which is the, the, maybe the oldest uh, in terms of when the different books of the Bible were written. This may be the first written account of what the apocalypse may look like. Uh, there's, uh, there's one in Isaiah. Mark chapter 13 is an apocalyptic uh, vision. Our reading this morning is just the first part of that. I've preached a few sermons on Mark in the last couple of months, and there's a consistent theme running through them that uh, has shown up uh, both in my sermons and in the book of Mark. Uh, Jesus explains something, the disciples don't get it, and the disciples don't want to admit in front of each other that they don't get it. Jesus walks out of the temple. One of his disciples says, wow, what large stones. What large buildings. This is kind of a reminder that the disciples, or at least some of them, might not have gotten into Jerusalem all that often. Uh, one of my favorite plays uh, uh, is uh, Oklahoma by Rodgers and Hammerstein. Uh, and there's a song there called uh, Kansas City in that play. The cowboy Will comes back from visiting the big city of Kansas City. 
uh, to his rural community, and, and this is set back in Western times in, in, when they're still migrating across, the, across the, the Great Migration, across the Western Plains, and Will comes back and tells them about his visit to the big city, and one of the lyrics goes, everything's up to date in Kansas City. They've gone about as far as they can go. They went and built a skyscraper seven stories high about as high as a building ought to grow. Julia used to work in the, in the Hancock building, uh, so she might disagree that seven stories is as high as a building ought to, ought to go. Yeah, you know, when we lived in Silver Spring, we had an apartment that was on the 10th floor. It was a really nice view, and we, we actually looked out on the, uh, uh, the first thing across the street, a road from us was the high school and the football field. So you could watch, you know, from a little bit of a distance, you could watch the football games from our uh, you know, from off of our porch and stuff like that. It was, it was a nice view, but we didn't feel like we were in some huge, incredibly tall building or anything. So whichever disciple it was that was kind of acting like Gomer Pyle, golly, look at all those big store, stones, big buildings. You know, he, he probably had not seen a whole lot of Jerusalem. And after that, exclamation of wonder. Jesus says that all of these buildings will be destroyed. There won't be one stone left on another stone. These huge buildings, these huge stones will all be toppled. Four of the disciples get with Jesus privately. This must have really troubled them because normally they come one or two at a time. This time four of them came and they still had, they had more questions. You know, when is this gonna happen? What do you mean? When does this start? What do we need to watch for? And with his answer, Jesus begins a description of the apocalypse that is coming at the end of the world. Let me talk a minute about dates in the Bible. For a long time, you'll, you'll read a, a date like uh, 1932 AD. And for a long time, I thought that A.D., when you see it in dates, meant after death or after Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, I learned later that I was wrong. It comes from a Latin term, Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. And that counts forward from Jesus' birth. So there is no year zero. The year before Jesus was born was 1 BC, one year before Christ. BC, I think the fact that BC stands for before Christ is why I, and, and I know other people, think that AD means after death. But it's, it's not. One year before Christ, 1 BC. And then the year that Jesus was born is 1 AD, the first year of our Lord. The year that Jesus was born was 1 AD. We live uh, in, this is 2024 AD, the 2020, 2024th year of our Lord. Uh, so Jesus died 33 AD, 33 years old. Now the temple that Jesus just walked out of uh, was under construction at the time. This is a, a kind of a model of, uh, of what it might have looked like. Uh, I mean, we don't know for sure. There are no contemporary pictures or anything. The stones that that unnamed disciple thought were so big, they weren't boulders or rocks. Or I know some of you have like big, a big rock in your, in your uh, front yard or, or you'll go by someplace and see some big rocks out near the driveway or something that you're to drive between to get in. These were finished stones that were being used to build the temple. Some of the stones were 35 feet long by 19, or excuse me, 18 feet wide by 12 feet high. 35 by 18 by 12 feet. The smallest of the stones, I looked, I don't know how accurate these estimates are. I looked it up, but 
you know, you never know how accurate the stuff you look up about things like this uh, might be. And, and we're talking just about the main construction, you know, some of the like little finishing stones, like the little, the little pointy stones there along the wall or at the top of the turrets, those, those weren't necessarily so big. But in terms of the construction of the basic temple itself, the smallest stone was estimated to be about two or three tons. And the largest stone was estimated to be about 570 tons, which would be over 1 million pounds. The temple was begun in 20 BC, 20 years before Jesus' birth, before Christ. It was finished in 60 AD, about 25 or 30 years after Jesus' death, 60, the year of our Lord. So it took 80 years to build the temple. The temple was destroyed by the Romans in 67 AD. It was finished in around 60 AD, and about seven years after it was finished, it was destroyed. No wonder the disciples could not conceive of that, this huge, magnificent temple that at the time of this conversation was still under construction, would be in shambles just seven, eight, ten years after it was completed. For the Jews of that time, that would be a catastrophe. That would be apocalyptic. And so no wonder they couldn't understand what they were hearing. No wonder they wanted more information from Jesus. And Jesus' answer starts out with a warning. Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and deceive many. That brings us back to Daniel. Daniel says that people who are wise, some translations say people who teach wisdom, will shine like the brightness of the heavens. Uh, Abraham's descendants, it's, it's not a matter of just not being able to count them. They're so bright. It just shines like the heavens. And, and, and that people who lead others to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and forever. It's easy for us to be led astray. It's easy for us to listen to and follow uh, false prophets or to do or say things that God does not want us to do or say. I don't mean false prophets just in the religious sense. That certainly happens. There have been people that have, have claimed to be God. Uh, uh, and there are you know, a couple that we have heard of from time to time, Jim Jones and the, the People's Temple. Uh, started out in Indiana, moved to California, went down to Guyana, had a mass suicide. Sun Myung Moon, uh, who uh, founded the Unification Church, he, he claimed to be a god. Uh, there, are, there have been many others that claim to be God, some we've heard of and some we haven't heard of, but it's not just in the religious sense. We all follow false prophets sometimes uh, in every aspect of our lives. Maybe it's political, maybe it's social, maybe it's, maybe it's religious. That's just our nature. That's what we do as sinful people. Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young did a song called Woodstock. It was written by Joni Mitchell. Part of that song goes, we are stardust. We are golden. We are caught in the devil's bargain. And we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. When Joni Mitchell wrote the song, I, I am pretty sure she did not have the book of Daniel in mind, but that lyric fits. When we get back to the garden, when we get back to the place where God wants us to be emotionally and spiritually, when we get back to a right relationship with God, we know the truth of God's teaching in our lives. We don't listen to false prophets like the serpent. We, we don't make bargains with the devil. We say the things we should say. We do the things we should do. We teach the things we should teach. 
Joni Mitchell said that we are stardust. When we do those good things, when we are wise and teach wisdom and lead others to righteousness, God, through Daniel, says that we are like the stars. In writing about our passage from Mark, Dana Castle says, I wonder if we might figure out a way to follow Jesus' instructions here and now. In the midst of current and coming destruction and persecution and oppression, can we keep our eyes peeled for signs of new futures? Can we be alert to the ways that God is still, as always, doing what God does? Can we learn from others who have given birth before to experience all this chaos not as despair, but as the beginning of the birth pangs of something bigger, broader, more just, and more compassionate than what has been. I would, at least, like to try. I'd like to try too. Will you join me? Let us be like the stars. Amen. Our closing song is number 567, verses 1, 3, and 5. How firm a foundation. You're welcome to stand if you wish. Go now with God, go in peace. Amen.